What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod. We're giving you another week of what's going on in pop culture. My name is Patchy and joined by my trusty red co-host Dave Martin Swagger. Dave, have you been playing all too well the 10 minute Taylor version oh, no. on repeat all weekend? All these people going after Jake G for 10 years ago, man. Come on. Leave the man alone. Hey, I mean, uh, that, that 10 minute version is pretty gutting. Uh, I guess. Yeah. You know, also, just looking back, I, I guess I I kind of forgot that Taylor Swift dated Jake Gyllenhaal. I always just kind of go to John Mayer. Uh, yes. Like right John. away. Right. Um, but what a weird what a weird couple. <laughs> yeah. Well, wasn't I think Taylor was like twenty two at the time, right? Like, well, she was twenty. It's in the song. You gotta go yeah, listen yeah. to it. Yeah. So dude. like, I don't. Know, as long as nothing bad happened, then I mean, who cares? You know. Yeah. They were you get a lot of famous adults. famous boyfriends at the time. Whatever. Also, yeah. he's a lot older than her, so. And she talks about that in the song. Actually, <laughs> it's... Dave, you should go listen to it right now. I think. But... No, no, no need. We, he's uh, doing have... crazy numbers, though. It is. It is. Uh, we talked about the impact of re-recording her albums when Fearless Taylor's version came out. So check that out. YouTube.com slash Nostalgia Pod. I don't have too much more to add this time around, but. Nice for the Taylor fans. I, again, would like Taylor to make more new music. At least this uh, new All Too Well is like a new-ish thing. So that that's something, right? But uh, yeah, just releasing some cut songs from the vault yep. alongside the re-recording, that, that doesn't do too much for me. A couple of uh, collaborations on there. Chris Stapleton I saw. I think I saw one with, one with Ed Sheeran on there. I just clicked through a couple of the... Uh, the, my my favorite track from the album. I wasn't necessarily listening straight through, but um, you know, I, I I really like that these Taylor versions are getting a lot of shine, getting some a lot of plays. Obviously, um, Red obviously I think was the the big one people were waiting for. So I don't I don't expect the the re recorded albums after this if they come like 1989 um, to be nearly as popular, but um man a couple of real huge bangers on that album so shout out to yep. t swift we're gonna be talking about some uh artists that may or may not have dropped some bangers this weekend as well definitely talking about some people that have dropped some bangers throughout the years we make our grammys predictions which uh crazy award season is just around the corner now yeah for and real. a couple movies from this weekend you made it to uh belfast which i'm excited to hear your your thoughts because i think there's been some some divisive conversation about it so i'm looking forward to getting into it but uh before we get too too far into these conversations go to youtube.com slash nostalgia pod or soundcloud.com slash nostalgia pod and follow the podcast anyway hit that subscribe on youtube we appreciate it um let's start with courtney barnett dave the uh australian uh rocker um you know, so my, my relationship with Courtney Barnett is interesting because I feel like around the time I started going to festivals, 2012, 2013, through like 2015, 16, is when she really started blowing up, right? She had a couple of those EPs, uh, uh, Sea of Split Peas, I think was the one that I, I first remember listening to. Uh, and then came the albums. Um, sometimes I sit and think, sometimes I just sit. And uh, that around that time was when she just took off and felt like she was going to be this face of the female rock movement uh, for a while. And I, I feel like she's kind of grown comfortably into like a, a really solid artist, but not one that pops off with huge hits, things that get radio play or, or a lot of attention. Um, you know, and as we move uh, or as we talk today about her four, at least fourth album, things take time, take time. Uh, I feel like it's a, a lot of the same for Courtney on this. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because her, her vocal style, her delivery is kind of like a trademark of her and, and something that I think obviously stands out about the way she performs her songs. But I kind of felt like the, the delivery almost kind of felt lackadaisical on this at times for me. And I was a little bit just more impressed with, the the craftsmanship of, of the, the sonics of the song especially the guitar playing obviously which she's a master at but how did you feel about things take time take time uh i did like it i liked it uh 
I think this is actually her third uh, solo album. A lot of Sea Lice is a collab album with Kurt Vile from uh, the War on Drugs. Uh, but yeah, I liked. Uh, what is it? Take time, take time. Things take Things time. Things take, take time, time, take time. Yes, and I think it's just because I, I do enjoy her vocals. Uh, mm-hmm. There's just like a fullness, just like a presence to how she sings that I find really enjoyable when it's mixed with her brand of acoustic guitar. So mm-hmm. I just find in general, like her music's really easy to listen to, really easy to put on. Uh, I don't know if I'm like super wowed by her lyrics. I know she's kind of uh, triumphed and liked for like her like subtle humor and her witty lines and all that. I don't know if I, I grasp, grasp that too much, but mm-hmm. I still enjoy how it sounds. And I thought this, you know, didn't didn't change my opinion of her to this point, but I thought it sounded pretty good. Yeah, you know, it's uh, I think we're very much kind of in the same way, which, you know, I, I don't think her like vocals blow anybody away, but her, just her delivery is so unique. And it definitely brings a certain presence to the songs. It's, it's almost like it's almost like she's telling a, a like witty joke or, or like a really dry joke, like in every single song, just very like. Uh, straight faced it feels like but obviously with some uh twisty or um you know like uh, tongue-in-cheek lyrics at times um you know i think the the tracks for me that stood out the most were the ones that felt like either she was really leaning into like the sunniness of her guitar playing like a song like ray street sounds pretty sunny to me um the uh i think it's if i don't hear from you tonight I really liked a um, little upbeat drumming there. Um, but then at times uh, I found myself a little like, I don't know about bored, but just not as into it on things like maybe like take it day by day, which is like a little more like bass heavy, a little like funkier, just yeah. didn't work as well for me. But I appreciate her just like, you know, uh, trying to like pull a couple of things. I don't, I don't think this was like a, I don't, this doesn't feel like an opus album or anything like that to her. Just kind of more of the same, like you said. Yeah. Seems like she made a lot of this, made, made this in lockdown in Melbourne, uh, also framed by the, you know, severe wildfires that were happening in Australia mm-hmm. at the time. Interestingly, she wasn't able to use her normal studio band to record. So she kind of had to, uh, circumvent that i think one of the, the guys from war paint helped her craft this more or less uh in a more diy fashion than someone established like her would probably prefer uh and yeah it's funny i actually liked uh take it day by day a mm-hmm. little more than you did just because i thought like the drum and the guitar combination like that tempo just stood out to me um, yeah it was nice for again her vocal delivery uh and then that ray street which i believe is one of the early singles I just thought the guitar was really good on that one. And then uh, if I don't hear from you tonight, uh, same thing. But yeah, I mean, overall, I think it's just kind of like, it's not like a crazy vibe or anything. It's just it's just kind of pleasant to listen to, but it might not uh, hold your attention all the way through, even though it's kind of short. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, Courtney Barnett, just uh, I feel like an artist that, I I expect it to be bigger by now. I guess just hasn't like broken out in the way I expected. Yeah, n- nominated for Best New Arts the Grammy several years ago. At this point, lost to Megan Trainer. Uh, funny enough, which is mm-hmm. probably one of the weaker picks of the last ten years for that award. But How about uh, that bass, baby. Yeah. <laughs> funny enough, I actually just by complete happenstance was waiting in line at an airport behind Courtney Barnett and her band in 2019 and it was a really funny thing because i just was looking at the people in front of me and i noticed all these instrument cases and i was like hmm must be a band and i keep looking looking i see like rough trade stickers and i see like label insignias and i'm like oh wait a minute who is, who is this and then i saw courtney waiting in line for the uh uh ticket counter just like me i was like oh shit this is courtney barnett However, I'm not a big enough fan to interrupt her day, so I let it go. Just took a quick Snapchat and was uh, was uh, continuing to wait in line. Really funny, just to just come across someone famous in the airport. I'd never uh, seen anyone before. 
yeah the the stars they're just like us <laughs> um no that, that that's a cool story i've, I've had a few run-ins that with um like uh, my my most notable one is Andre three thousand. Um, mm. was on the same flight as him and snuck into first class to talk to him. But yeah, it is like kind of surreal when you see an artist uh, just in, in the open like that. But why don't we uh, switch gears from rock to something something a little smoother, something a little silkier, Silk Sonic baby, dropping the long anticipated album an Evening with Silk Sonic. Uh, we got to leave the door open back in March, <laughs> back in March. So it's been an eight month lead up to this album. Obviously, Silk Sonic, the Anderson Pock and Bruno Mars collab. Dave, what was your just like hype level going into this? Definitely looking forward to it tremendously. It's it's actually hilarious to consider this this album rollout because in the meantime, they won the BET award for best group. When only Leave the Door Open was out. Not even the second single, Skate, had come out yet. And they won a best group. <laughs> really funny. Uh, obviously, an a award show such as BET Awards Fights wants people to show up and perform. So you understand why they won. But uh, still really funny. And yeah, I mean, we just did our Anderson Pack album rankings at youtube.com slash nostalgia pod. So we've been anticipating this album and we are big fans of Anderson's. So uh, seeing him get his first number one song with the door open in general be exposed to a much wider mainstream audience is really great because he's deserving of such with his talent and musical output to this point and of course more bruno mars it had been a long time since bruno mars had released an album of any kind uh 24 karat magic was back in 2016 pre-election obama time you know, it's been a minute for Bruno Mars. Yeah. So even if this isn't a proper Bruno solo album, it's still better than nothing because it's been a long time. And Leave the Door Open was such a uh, successful first single, um, critically adored in, in addition to being so popular that obviously the album hype was quite high. And they had originally said that this was delayed till 2022. And then next thing I know, here it is coming out right before Adele, sneaking it in there for us. And I have to say, I was not disappointed at all. Um, as as you set the stage so wonderfully, uh, we're big fans of both of these guys. And I think the singles, um, though, obviously leave leave the door open is the the one that stands out from the three singles, Skate and Smoking Out the Window. I think they all were pretty interesting and, and exciting in different ways. But then, you know, I, I opened the album. And it's it's an intro track and then only eight more tracks and we had heard right. three of them so i was like oh you know the, i'm hoping these other five really hit because man there's there's just not as much here as i was hoping to get but i was really not disappointed at all um i, I loved listening to this album and I've, I've run it through a couple of times already uh obviously a quick listen like i mentioned but just a, a few tracks here just really really pop off for me uh what, what was just your general uh, response to the first listen through yeah obviously positive i also noted the uh brevity you know it definitely stands out but what i think what shines through is that even with just eight full songs and only five of them being new the you know admiration the uh tribute the homage to 70s soul and r&b a little funk in there too well, disco at times. This just, you know, blatant, obvious love for the past. It's oh, just yeah. done so well, so warmly, so effectively mm -hmm. that, like, you, you can't help but just really enjoy it. It doesn't matter that it's clearly just inspired by, you know, the past. It, it's totally cool because it's, it's just done so well. And you can tell they're having a nice time doing it. Yeah. And if you, if you needed more evidence of, the uh the callback to the past like funk r&b soul right. era yeah bootsy collins narrating throughout it so i mean you got a guy who was working closely with like the james brown and other uh people who are like the creators of that movement and the drivers of that movement back in the time as an anchor but oh man like this thing just it, it just is a pleasure to listen to from start to finish um you know i, I just want to call out one track because i've been so excited to talk about this track all day 
track four after last night with mm. Thundercat and Bootsy Collins, man. Yeah. That that's the one for me off this. I've played that back probably like ten times already. Just the the funky sound of it, the build up and the chorus is just so yeah. fun and it really brings in that like it brings in everything that they do together or that each of them do well individually and mesh it together so well. Like Bruno just crooning on it. Uh, Anderson bringing like the funky drums, a couple of his like, uh, you know, interesting vocal uh, lyrics to this. And then just it, it just flows together so well. Just a really, really fun track to listen to. What, what Was that one of your standouts as well? For sure. Yeah, it, it's yeah. funny to see Thundercat and Bootsy Collins on a song together. Like you said, Bootsy Collins, Parliament, Thundercat. It's kind of the descendant of Bootsy yep. Collins <laughs> in terms of bass players, right? You know, uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, Pac and Bruno harmonize tremendously on After Last Night. Mm-hmm. Pac in particular, I feel like that pre-chorus is super fun. The gushy, gushy part, you know? Yep. Uh, <laughs> gushy goo, whatever he says. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that one's tremendous. Um, and yeah, it that's also, I think, a really important song because that's one of the best vocal performances from Anderson standing out mm-hmm. on his own. I think if I have a light criticism, it's not so much a criticism as it is just preference. I would have loved Anderson to get to show out a little bit more on this because mm-hmm. Bruno can show off so easily with so his easily. vocals because of his vocal strength, right? And we and we're everyone's so used to listening to Bruno Mars. We know what it sounds like. It just it stands out, it pops. Yeah. And Anderson, really talented, multifaceted artist, but as you said, not as mainstream to this point he doesn't quite get to let loose and show all his sides as much as say uh, he does on his own music. Obviously he's fitting into the theme they're doing here. He's fitting into the genre they're, they're, they're making. So I totally get it, but it was cool to hear Anderson's personality really come out at times on like after last night or fly as me, where he's actually doing yeah. a bit of rapping in that second verse, you know, I really like those moments because they are a little bit brief, you know, usually Anderson's kind of supporting Bruno when it's going back and forth with him, harmonizing with him. So when you do get like the true, like Anderson brilliance that is familiar to people that like his other music, uh, I really like those moments. Yeah, I agree. And it, I, I, I mean, if you want to know our admiration for Anderson, like Dave mentioned, we did a whole album ranking so go check that out and you can hear more of our opinion on him but uh i completely agree that um having more standout moments for anderson could have been a good thing but to your point with bruno even on the song after last night when he comes in talking about like the cars or whatever like you know the second half of the song and he just kind of like pulls solo from their their harmony it's just such a smooth moment and then you're just like man we need more bruno mars music we need another solo album just give it to us, man. We need it at this point. Five years is too long. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's been a minute. Uh, the Smoking Out the Window, which was the third single technically, but only came out like a week and a half ago. Uh, I like that song a lot. I think Anderson's awesome mm-hmm. on that. The music video, though, is really funny to me because if you've watched a Bruno Mars music video before, you know that uh, the director of photography goes to great lengths with perspective and angles to hide Bruno Mars's height. Obviously, famously, not a tall man. I just love how they always do it, whether it's uh, Bruno being much closer to the camera than the people in the back. They always make sure that it's not obvious that Bruno's short. I love that shit. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> it, it is funny to like see how they hide it, but they always do a good job with it. Um, what other songs stood out to you? What else did you like? Yeah, so f- funny enough, I actually like Skate more than Leave the Door Open. I know that's not really? a popular wow. take. Wow. I, I, just, I just think it's like it is more... Uh, upbeat fun song obviously yeah. leave the door open and i understand why that wows people more so that and put on a smile like those more ballady songs not the ones i like to visit quite as much uh but i feel like i feel like basically every other song on the album is really fun really you know up tempo and yeah y- y- you like to hear that energy um i think maybe, maybe this song that might perhaps great people a little bit would be 777 Mm-hmm. Uh, just like you know that that casino uh trip lyrics it's really uh party atmosphere you know but the the hooks that's probably one of the weaker hooks mm-hmm. a little bit you know uh the you know, let the the 777 let's go part but i still think the song's pretty fun 
Um, but I, I quite like Fly as Me, the bass, the drums on that, yeah. the chorus, pack rapping, as I said. Notably credited as writers on that, James Fauntleroy and Big Sean. Mm. As of right now, it's not listed, but I wonder if they interpolated a Big Sean song because Fauntleroy obviously has worked with Big Sean before. As of right now, I, I can't find that information, so maybe Sean and James Fauntleroy help, helped on that song. That'd be interesting. Yeah, definitely an interesting. Uh, no, I hadn't noticed that Big Sean was credited on that, but uh, really interesting. I also noticed that Ray Charles, or is that, is this Ray Charles McCullough, not actual Ray Charles? I can't tell here. Yeah, no, it's not actual Ray Charles. It's different. Yeah, it's I mean, a, it would have been an interpolation yeah. if, it, if it was him, obviously. Um, yeah, I agree. I think fly, I think that whole run, leave the door open through smoking out the window, um, yeah. really is just uh, the, the meat and potatoes of the album, just I undeniable. Agree. A skate is great. I like seven seven seven. I like the mm-hmm. the guitar sound a lot, and I think Blast Off is a really smooth, nice yeah. wrap up to the album. The guitar so. is good on that one too. We're only getting really eight tracks. I mean, <laughs> maybe only have one. Uh, put a sm- mm-hmm. put on a smile that I I didn't like love, but I was like, okay, it sounds fine. Bruno sounds good on this. Uh, right, it's right. it's pretty impressive. So good, yeah. really good shit. Yeah, I noticed this album was released on both Aftermath and Atlantic, so it's on both Anderson and Bruno's respective deals. It wasn't just listed as one of them. It's truly a collab album. And I can't imagine Silk Sonic as an entity exists beyond the the forthcoming tour. Like I I can't imagine they make music again, uh, especially in this genre for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, because again, the next Bruno album needs to come out. Anderson needs to capitalize on this profile with his own solo work. So it's going to be a while before we get more Silk Sonic, but for a tight album, you know, with a lot of hype leading into it, uh, it's just a great success. Really fun. And of course, we'll be hearing these songs for a long time. Two Grammys from now is when this will be up for the big awards. So it'll be around a while, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Man, I, I just like I just like the idea of this propelling into a a, a new Bruno album because uh, we, we've gotten a lot of Anderson in the last couple of years, and mm. uh, again, if you go back to our rankings, we feel like it hasn't been always his top tier stuff. Uh, hard to reach some of his highs from earlier in his career at points, but uh, just to, getting Bruno back, getting him in this like mold where he's just crooning and smooth and having fun, just nothing better than that. So uh really excited uh for what, what's next for him and for anderson but this album did not disappoint check it out and also go to our nostalgia best of 2021 on spotify playlist um we're gonna have a, probably a silk sonic song or two i think we already have uh, leave the yeah. door open on there um and also a courtney barnett song so check that out but dave let's move on to netflix which uh dropped two movies that we're going to be talking about today the first is red notice and if you notice if you're watching on youtube uh big stars in this ryan reynolds gal gadot and the rock dwayne johnson uh basically a a three-headed monster spearheading this art heist buddy cop film um mm-hmm. you know it's action comedy it's many yeah. things it's it's all is everything and nothing all at the same time it feels like at points um you know it's funny i feel like where we've kind of gotten to and this this feels very much like it like it fits for this take um netflix to me feels like it has three different lanes for movies it's either they're gonna go like the romantic comedy, really cheesy, kind of crappy love story. They're going to do like the really auteur movie, like the one we're about to talk about in a second with passing. And then they kind of just go with these like fun action comedy movies that mm-hmm. are pretty brainless. And you just kind of like sit down and you're like, oh, well, that was fun. And I had a few laughs and some cool set pieces. And mm-hmm. now I can forget about this movie for quite a while. And Red Notice fits that perfectly. Um, how did you How did you feel just sitting through this uh two-hour movie yeah again not a not a movie i think anyone had expectations for it's a movie that netflix actually picked up early on the process from universal pre-pandemic it was not dumped on them they actually just kind of took it over from universal and you can you can see why because it's something they can just throw on their front page 
and it'll be watched tremendously. And because it has three very famous people in it, it's easy to advertise. And it's, it's a great success for Netflix. Whether it's that great, it's kind of irrelevant for their goals with a movie like this. And yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit, honestly, for having no expectations. You know, just kind of watching three actors I like, three actors that are nice to watch. Uh, they all have fun presence and, and charisma. Mm-hmm. It's kind of good enough, honestly. I thought the movie looked pretty good. You know, they did film in Italy a fair amount with, for this. So I was just kind of on, on the ride. And that was good enough. You know, it, it's not it's not a great movie. But I did like this more than Jungle Cruise, honestly, if we're talking The Rock. Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, I didn't like it as much as Free Guy, if we're talking Ryan Reynolds. But I think Free Guy just has a little more under the hood uh, thematically, mm-hmm. which is which is well documented at this point. But Red Notice, uh, pretty fun. You know, for, for a Netflix movie, this is for a Netflix blockbuster. That I mean, the price tag on this movie has been banging about a lot. I believe it's their most expensive movie as of right now. That'll be surpassed by The Gray Man next year, the Chris Evans Gosling movie. But it's a very expensive movie. It's the whole thing, right? But I thought it was pretty cool, honestly. Yeah, I, I thought it was definitely um, one of the better like uh, action comedy movies that we've gotten from Netflix, for sure. Um, I, I, I thought Ryan Reynolds in The Rock, though, uh, I do you know, I, I never really bought The Rock as being like this like FBI agent. That seemed like a very easy thing to just see through pretty quickly. Um, I thought that their chemistry was was fairly decent. You know, The Rock kind of playing like the straight man and Ryan Reynolds just getting to be himself. Uh, right. which well, is... the, and The Rock being the straight man is, is also The Rock being himself. That's kind True. of his role every time as we talked about Jungle Cruise. Uh, he definitely got to be a little bit more romantic in this one at, at points, which is, is mm-hmm. good for The Rock. Um, it, in Free Guy, was Ryan Reynolds uh, just kind of himself in that as well? Oh, for sure. Yeah, Free Guy is so fourth wall breaking and meta that it's kind of well, overdosing on it, you know? And that's mm-hmm. where some of the criticism comes in. But yeah, I mean, this was clearly just textbook trademark Ryan Reynolds, mile a minute, spit out as many laps for one-liners as mm-hmm. he possibly can kind of thing. And yeah, it's one of those things where like you, you'd like it if the writing's really good. In this case, that's not, 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 not true. Or if like everything around it is okay. Like six underground, Michael Bay, just Michael Bay doing crazy ass shit. You, you live with Ryan Reynolds doing his, his thing, you know, mm-hmm. red notice jet setting around. It looks pretty nice. It's kind of fun. You live with Ryan Reynolds just kind of being dumb sometimes. Yeah, uh, totally. And uh, I think, even though sometimes the like mile a minute jokes can be a little bit grating, I think, and just kind of like, okay, like his stick can wear thin after a while. I think, I think it was like fine enough. And uh, especially once you start getting more Gal Gadot in this, I'm just going to say her name differently every time. Cause I never know if yeah. it's Gadot, Gadot. Um, I think it's Gadot. I think it is too. Once um, she comes in as the Bishop and is much more involved. And I think the movie really just kind of like moves from there. I do have to say, very plot heavy movie they're going they're going a lot of places uh a lot of MacGuffins. i did like that <laughs> ryan Mac- ryan reynolds is like look for the box that says MacGuffin on it when they were <laughs> looking for the the third egg because I, I thought that was a yeah. great yeah. Uh, meta moment yeah exactly because like the movies in that sense movies like yeah we know this is kind of dumb and unbelievable so just go with it we're, 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 we understand mm-hmm. yeah absolutely um yeah and you know it th- this is it kind of pulls in uh, like so many things that's like you're going to find something you like here, whether it's like the art heist aspect, whether it's the action scenes, um, you know, whether it's uh, the like goofiness of it. I like uh, Boche. Um, There's Dimatopoulos. Yes. Yes. From, uh, from Silicon Valley. Valley. <laughs> Fantastic. And just like seeing him show up, I was like, oh, yeah, this, this shit's about to get weird and funny. And it, it definitely did. Um and yeah, you know, it. <laughs> I, I thought the Ed Sheeran moment, though, <laughs> kind of felt like out of nowhere. And I was like, is this, is this real? Like, is this, is this really happening in this movie? It, I, it got a laugh out of me. And, you know, me Netflix too. today was trying to, like, uh, pump that, make it a meme a bit. Maybe maybe it will, maybe it will stick. But it, there was enough about this movie where I was like, that was a good way to spend two hours. I've watched worse movies than this. For so. sure. 
Yeah. Uh, again, the meta moment, right? Ed Sheeran cameo playing himself is one thing, but him saying, I was in Game of Thrones is already acknowledging what you're thinking in your head about random, unexpected Ed Sheeran cameos in a movie. So, uh-huh. or TV. Love it. Um, Ed Sheeran, bitch. <laughs> uh, I'm also always here for any, like, plot finding, like, lo- like hidden Nazi gold and stuff oh, yeah. like that. Uh, obviously, that, that stuff, the Cleopatra's eggs, all that's the historical fiction stuff is fictional. But I mm. still love, I always love that stuff, you know, like, uh, reminded me of one of the old plots for Indiana Jones 5 before they actually started making it was that Indy was looking for a lo- uh, the, the famous Nazi gold train that was perhaps buried somewhere in Europe, which probably is totally fake. Uh, I love that kind of stuff. So them finding a secret bunker in Argentina or wherever they went, uh, really fun. Uh, yeah, and I think it's just like the charisma. Uh, of mm-hmm. these actors yeah i mean like, their lines they aren't that great i i, I think particularly of the one moment where the rock and and reynolds they like are having like a heart to heart when they realize they're kind of the same even though they're opposites and then uh the rock's like yeah and you know i i became a i came a, a cop to stick back to my dad just like you like he just basically completely spells out like the plot oh, yeah. development that just happened like as if the audience didn't remember what had previously been told stuff like that they told you like the script is nothing to write home about but uh i still had a nice time yeah no i i did too i i just would jumped on to uh gal gadot's um like filmography here right and i'm looking here and you know pretty much out, outside of wonder woman in the fast franchise i mean she's just had kind of like one-off movies here and there mm. ralph breaks the internet type, uh, vocal, uh voice role Coming up, though, she's got Death on the Nile, Hell Kenneth yeah. Branagh-directed movie. Oh, and then we have Cleopatra. Uh, at some point in the future, that's there's no date on that, but she's right. playing Cleopatra. In that. I yeah. wonder... Patty Jenkins, once again. That that feels like potential for her to maybe get some more shine. Uh, I'm interested to see like how, how if that will be... Like, even what the concept is going to be. Patty Jenkins obviously has a lot of chops, but really seeing them them together it's hard to think is she gonna kind of revert back to that wonder woman style and that type of movie or is this going to be a bit right. more of a biopic uh, yeah just need more information on it. De- definitely definitely tantalizing right it hasn't been cleopatra movie in, in quite some time um that's a paramount and with the news of star wars rogue squadron for patty jenkins being delayed seems like wonder woman 3 will be jumping that in patty's schedule so we don't really know when cleopatra's fitting into that because again god without's involved in both projects too so i don't think the movie's close doesn't sound like it at this time but i mean that that sounds really exciting you know i hope i hope it's really great yeah it's a, it's a good look for um for her for sure um anyways red notice you can find worse films for sure. So if you just want something fun, go check it out. Something that's a a little bit more, takes a little bit more of your attention, a little bit more of your thought, I'd say, is Passing. Uh, Rebecca Hall's um, film debut, or a directorial debut, I should right. say, um, on Netflix as well, starring Tessa Thompson, uh, Ruth Nega, Andre Holland, um, Bill Camp, a lot of a lot of people we like Alexander Skarsgård. Um, I guess I want to start here. Rebecca Hall. When you think of her, what do you think of? I, I go to the town. I guess first. Yeah, I go to the town as well. Uh, I mean, we actually just talked about her kind of recently with Godzilla vs. Kong. Yep. Not her. Not not the best role or anything. Um, and I know she got a lot of love for the Night House, the horror movie from last year. But yeah, I, I go to the town for sure. But she's, yeah. she's been working for quite some time. If you look at, look at the the filmography, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously in an Iron Man movie, um, oh, everything must go. Forgot about that. Frost Nixon. Oh wow. Yep. Yeah, she's in a couple of things I like here. Um, anyways, I was I was surprised because I, I she wasn't someone I was like oh I can't I can't wait to see her get behind the the camera and tell mm-hmm. some stories and especially a story like this was not something I expected her to tell. You know passing um it centers around two friends played by uh tessa thompson as uh irene i believe her name is yes uh, Rini. and Field. then ruth nega as claire and ruth nega as claire um is able to pass 
as a white woman back in, I believe this is 1920s. Yes, New York City. 1920s yeah. New York City. Um, depression. Her, her, she's able to pass so convincingly that her husband, Alexander Skarsgård, is not able to tell that she is a black woman in reality. And after they come back into contact, um, they start spending more time together and it kind of sends at least uh, Tessa Thompson's life into some sort of reflection or, or maybe not, not so good direction. Right. Um, right. I, again, not a story, not a story I expected to be told by Rebecca Hall. Did you feel like she pulled this movie off? Uh, yes. Yes, it did. It's uh, adapted from the 1929 Nella Larson novel. And the reason I wasn't expecting it is because I did not know that Rebecca Hall is of mixed race. Obviously someone that can pass quite convincingly. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just not something I was thinking about, but there was a lot of hype about this movie at Sundance. Netflix purchased it for $15 million. Big, pricey, buzzy award season buy. And nice, you know, I think nice end note for Hall because she kind of, you know, looked under the covers for loose change to fund this movie. The last uh, bit of the ten million that they used to make this movie apparently was very hard to come by, and she had to like apply for grants and stuff. And at one point, she was approached to sacrifice her vision a little bit and do it in color, not in black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's nice to see the success, you know, realized, and I feel like um, earned uh, for her as a filmmaker. And you, you'll see some like first feature directing awards flowing in for her you have to imagine i think she already got one of those noms at the gotham awards um but uh yeah i mean i i didn't i didn't read the book didn't uh you know i kind of just knew the basic log line as the title suggests but i i still thought it was pretty good you know it's not the movie i expected it to be though and i i think hall deserves a lot of credit because there's a lot of i think intentionality with how the movie is staged and also how it's written honestly it's not like super in your face about how irene is feeling about things as she's going through this period of change and reflection you know it's 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 more subtle and or understated than i expected yeah absolutely um and i i never felt like the movie fully lagged like i think there's definitely some parts where it's like people having conversations like subtle moments that you have to like kind of tune into and I think if you if you don't totally pay attention you can miss some of the the things that are communicated in the movie and some of the moments that really uh impact the overall story that's being told but it feels like it moves it propels forward pretty well and I I give a lot of credit to Tessa Thompson um and Ruth Nega who I think both give just like really really strong performances especially thompson obviously being the the main character in this as rini but just kind of seeing her spiral seeing the like looks on her face or like the the way that her like mouth moves when she like sees brian and claire like talking to each other at like uh, a party or at the club or things like that just like the small little moments really like uh surprised me and just communicated so much and I was I was just really impressed with this. Um, you know, obviously, the, like we mentioned, there's a lot of talent, but I think for Rebecca Hall to pull a movie like this off and have it hit as hard as it does uh, left me thinking a lot about a lot of the themes in the movie, about the overall relationship between Claire and Rini. Um, I just was I was I was impressed for sure. Um, d- tell me about some moments or some some scenes in the movie that really stood out to you. You know, I'd say in general, the fact that it's shot in 4-3 aspect ratio is really effective because it's intentional and actually, like, makes an impact. You know, the, the feeling of being boxed in that Rini is sensing mm-hmm. comes across in the way the movie is shot. On top of that, you have a shot in black and white, but as Rebecca Hall has said in some of the press, it's not black and white, oh, this is super obvious. It's actually, like, all the shades of gray we see when we watch something in black and white and i also like the effect that the black and white has on two you know uh light-skinned performers ruth negan tessa thompson the 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 effect of the passing like it's all very uh effective and kind of like 
transportive, you know, the way mm-hmm. the way the movie's made in monochrome. So I really, I just, in general, I just really appreciate how it was made. Um, also, I like that set in New York specifically, um, you know, color lines, Jim Crow were happening everywhere, not just in the South. Important to see that portrayed. That was great. Uh, yeah, you know, obviously the ending, the ending I think is pretty, pretty good. But a lot of like the, you know, the the scenes in the middle, right? Like a lot of stuff with Rini, it's, it's just kind of a lot to like chew on because it's just her kind of just parsing her identity and how she feels and like her perspective changing and stuff. And maybe to some, it, it's not focused enough or it's a little vague. I don't know. And like to me, I, it's not like I was like super clear all the time what was being conveyed either. But I just think like the overall message, the overall mood is really purposeful and that's why uh, the movie works for me yeah those like scenes in the middle um i'm thinking about like the dinner scene where uh andre holland's brian is uh talking to their their children about the lynching of john carter um was it was it john carter um yes yes and uh, the, the the famous boxer and um you know the Tessa Thompson not wanting her children to hear about these things and wanting to like protect them from uh, the realities of racism during that time and the danger that their children lived with because of their identity. Um, and then how that also played out in so many themes played out into the relationship and the insecurity she had in Brian and Claire's relationship and the paranoia she felt about a potential affair. Um, and just the way that it all kind of like interwove together I just thought was really really impressive um and you know you can just see these conversations being so layered and so uh uh, full of context and unspoken things and I just I just was really impressed with uh, the writing and the delivery of a lot of it I also thought Skarsgård played like uh, continuing a run of playing really good bad guys (laughs) um you know obviously from uh man i why can't i remember the, that show on hbo big little lies big little lies she's i can never remember the the name of it um playing uh big little lies bad guy and now the evil racist husband of claire in this who right. is very blatantly like yeah i don't like black people and she's like obviously can't tell who a black person is during this time which i i think is um just kind of like a i don't know if funny is the right word but just ironic i guess is supposed to be right. but then him at the end when uh Rini runs into him and then just kind of like the spiral from there and you just know it's coming where that like that confrontation is coming just was really uh really I think well done and he felt very menacing to me mm-hmm. at, at points so uh just impressed with a lot of this movie for sure and I, I really like the jazz in the background and kind of like as like the the running through line and it being like a neighbor who was playing it at, diff- at all hours of the night type of thing I thought was mm-hmm. a, a nice funny little touch so just some uh, some nice choices in this for sure. Yeah, in general, the choices make sense for Tessa Thompson, another period role after Sylvie's Love, and then Ruth Nega thematically following up uh, Loving, you know, the movie mm-hmm. about um, a mixed couple in the South, uh, where of course which she was Oscar nominated for. Definitely seems to be a continuation of uh, you know b- black storytelling that they're both very invested in. Uh, it's great to see. Um, notably, because this movie had financial struggles with its production, obviously a really short shoot, tight budget, they actually had to switch uh, their casting. And Bill Camp came into the movie because he was a New York City resident and thus mm. cheaper. Originally, they were looking at Benedict Cumberbatch for that role, but they never actually cast him because they just couldn't fit it into the budget. So funny to see that kind of stuff, you know, and a lot of times you don't hear about this, this, this information when the movies don't call come together in the end, but because passing is a success and, it's, you know, Netflix has embraced it. You get to hear more about how the sausage was made, so to speak. But yeah, yeah I was very happy with it. Absolutely. Um, a definitely a, a movie I would recommend checking out if, if you like any of these people or want to just enjoy a good movie for free or for free uh with your eight dollars a month on netflix but um for they won't yeah why don't we stay in black and white 
and talk about Belfast, um, a movie that is getting a lot of buzz, a lot of award buzz, you know, some talk of it potentially being like the Roma of this year. I didn't get to it. And so I'm, I'm kind of relying on you here. Is this going to be the Roma for 2022? Yeah. Is Belfast a best picture contender? All signs point to yes. And it's funny because there's a lot of obvious comparisons to Roma, right? Autobiographical film from a celebrated filmmaker, Roma, Ponce Cuaron, Belfast, Kenneth Branagh, Black and White, both these films. However, Belfast is a much more rousing, sentimental, feel-good type of movie. I don't think we necessarily say Roma it, it is, is quite like that. But I also don't think Belfast is on Roma's level, to be clear. And it's a movie I liked, but I didn't love it. And it would not be my best picture choice right now, you know, surveying the field, you know, as it, as it stands at the moment. Uh, but this movie does seem to be picking up that award steam. Toronto Audience Award in general just seems to be getting that groundswell. And we'll see again how this feel-good movie in the awards season goes, because we're going to get another one at the end of this week with King Richard starring Will Smith about the father of Richard, uh, Venus and Serena Williams, Richard Williams. So be interesting to see uh, how the two feel good movies do, but Belfast, um, you know, I think the, the key, the key with this movie is that it's centered around a kid, a little kid buddy. And our perspective is that of a child. Obviously this is our stand in for Kenneth Branagh's time growing up in Belfast and, Obviously, this is a very specific time in Ireland, Northern Ireland's history. It's the late 1960s, so it's right when the troubles are beginning, of, of which you know lasted for several decades. The you know ethnic violence between Protestants and Catholics, and in this case, this film, Buddy, is a Protestant family. He's not the one being targeted, but he lives on a integrated street, so he has neighbors that are Catholics and becoming the subject of the attacks as these Protestant groups become more violent. And obviously because he's a little kid, you know, I think he's like, you know, like a nine year old or whatever. It doesn't, the film doesn't really color in the, the gravity of a lot of the serious stuff that was just starting to pick up as the troubles began. And, and then again, you also expect that because it's a movie told by a kid. But it's not like Jojo Rabbit either, where Jojo, I think, was really like up in your face with a lot of that stuff, just because it was more humorous, but also like you had your Nazi characters in that film mm -hmm. as well. We don't really have that in, in Belfast. You just have this like one Protestant goon figure. But even even this character, he more interacts with Buddy's dad, played by Jamie Gornan. So it's I think it's almost more of a coming of age movie than it is a movie about coming of age during a difficult time. You know, I don't know if it completely comes together with like the gravity of the larger situation that it's taking place in. So what you're kind of left with is just a coming of age family film. And I think the acting is quite strong from all the adults in this. It's all, all the buddies, family, the parents, Jamie Dornan, as well as a uh, Katriana Balf, who we know from Outlander and recently Ford vs. Ferrari. And then the grandparents on uh, dad's side, played by Judy Dench and Kieran Hines. And the best scenes are just when these characters are talking to Buddy, honestly. Uh, in particular, I'd say Kieran Hines is the grandpa, is mm -hmm. the, the best uh, act, acting showcase of the bunch and probably the most likely to be nominated for a, mm. a supporting actor, although Balf's probably in the mix too for supporting actress. Um, th those moments, like, and you, you even watch the Belfast trailer, Heinz just has such a gravity, such a presence that we all know at this point that any kind of dialogue he's telling to Buddy, it's just like, it's just like write it on the poster type stuff. You know, you see these little snippets in the trailer. It's all really effective. But for me, I, I just... 
I don't know if the sentiment sentimentalness completely came together for me. It felt a little, a little maybe simpler than than I wanted. You know, I think part of that the staging is also a little a little basic. It's kind of on this one block the whole time, which kind of feels like you're on a studio back lot as a result. Mm-hmm. Um, the black and whiteness. I don't. I don't know if that conveys too much beyond it. Oh, this is in the past. This is a memory. You know, um, it's not as intentional and uh, multi-layered as it is in passing on Netflix. So, yeah, you know, Kenneth Branagh. He's an Oscar uh, darling in a certain sense. He's been nominated a bunch of times already, including for best director. I expect him to be nominated for best director and best picture once again for Belfast. But it's it's more in the good, not great camp for me. Mm. But and there's there's still still plenty to like about it so it sounds like it doesn't have the like i don't know if heart is the right word but maybe like the overall just like emotional impact that roma had you know i I think about some scenes in roma especially that like last scene where they're like going out into the ocean and stuff like Mm, that and just like how like tense and moving that was um it's not like it doesn't necessarily hit those highs but tells just like a nice general story of like coming of age and family and Right. Yeah. I'd, I'd say, I'd say that that's, that's a good read. Um, mm. Some of the best scenes too are when Buddy and the family, they go to the movies a few times. You see uh 1 million uh, years BC and uh chitty, chitty, bang, bang. And the, he, it's almost like Kenneth Branagh very obviously being, this is when I realized I love film, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. but those scenes are actually, I really get some of the best uh, Judy Dench moments or when uh, they're seeing a, stage adaptation of a christmas carol and she's like cracking mm. some jokes and stuff um and yeah like like balf is good dornan is good they don't have a whole lot to do balf has like the better speech towards the end and dornan i guess is dornan's presence and like his moments like fending off the goons with his words not trying to become a fighter not trying to get involved in all the bad shit that's going on even though they're quote on the right side as it were Dorian's good in that, but he doesn't quite get enough things to do really to like rise up and give this amazing performance. Part of it's because his character is going to England, going away, leaving the family a lot. So he's only in the movie in bits and pieces. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it, it's definitely a feel good movie. You could tell, um, I could tell the, the, the uh, theater I was in, people seem to be digging it. Uh, also, there's a moment where Buddy's reading a uh, Thor comic book from the 60s which is obviously a nice little nod to Kenneth Branagh, who directed the mm-hmm. first Thor film. So that was cool. But uh, yeah, I'd say the best, p- best part of that is probably Kieran Hines, honestly. Like he just nice. really makes a lot out of all his dialogue, all his scenes. I was actually um, pretty excited for Jamie Dornan in this because I feel like uh, obviously he's, <laughs> his career has been defined, I think, somewhat by the success or lack thereof of the Fifty Shades movies. And similar to uh, Robert Pattinson, who we're obviously big fans of, I, I wouldn't put Dorian in that that level for us quite yet. But you know, someone else who was uh, their career was seemed to be going in one direction based on a, a franchise that doesn't necessarily need to define them or, or their ability. So I'm, I'm glad he's getting some looks and some more serious films, and hope that this kind of propels him to some more work. But um, yeah, I, th- I I can't wait to see it. Definitely a movie I I wish I had been able to make it out to see, but it's going to be one that I see before uh, award season because uh, we're going to be talking about it more for sure. So uh, stay tuned, hang tight, let us know your opinion. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, drop a comment. Let us know if you liked Belfast or not. Dave, let's let's do it though. Grammy time, right around the corner, January 31st, a little bit earlier than than they typically have them this year and you know it feels a bit in thinking about who is going to be dominating the awards nominations like this might be the year where the real youth movement comes into it we obviously had billy a couple years back billy eilish a couple years back uh winning pretty much every major category i think it was every major category for her first album and that felt a bit like okay The Grammys are trying to be more hip, more with it. But this year, it seems pretty poised that not only is Billy going to get some nominations, Lil Nas X, if you're watching YouTube behind Dave, 
and then uh, Olivia Rodrigo all have chances to have major nominations, potentially major wins. Uh, are the Grammys trying to be more in touch with what's actually popular in music? You know, it's not a bad question because there might be some truth to it. You know, um, The weekend last year, infamously not nominated for Blinding Lights, not nominated for After Hours, really pissed off The weekend, and he chose to focus a lot of his efforts on the anonymous nominating committees that defined how the Grammy ballots were originally shaped Mm. for the broad swath of Academy voters. Those committees are no longer here. So it tends to reason that a lot of the blockbustery albums, more populist stuff, will probably start rising up because it's more of a popular vote type thing than it has been in the past. So obviously it will take some time, take some years to determine if this ultimately is a good thing by seeing what's nominated. But it just seems like the Academy, Recording Academy, just kind of gets to vote now, uh, based off obviously what's submitted by the artists and the labels. So yeah, I think this this might lend itself to being at least a little bit more in touch. Remains to be seen. Yeah, I I feel optimistic. You know, it's it's interesting because in doing the research for this, like on the one hand, I see Billie Eilish, Olivia Rodrigo, Lil Nas X, like Doja Cat being mentioned in there, and I'm like, okay, these are definitely popular artists that have risen quickly. You know, maybe getting uh, recognition right off the bat not having to like pay their due so to speak but then i also see like her you know potentially getting nominated i'm just like you know sometimes they just can't get out of their own way and so i never really know exactly what to expect from the the grammy nomination so uh i'm interested to see what we decide on as as the locks and which ones seem more on the fringe why don't we start though with um best new artists because i think I think there's a lot to dig into there and i'm really excited to see how they go about this so uh, we'll start with just saying olivia rodrigo is almost a sure thing right like she's she's going to be nominated she's going to be probably a focal point of the award show in general and, and i'm sure she's going to want to play along as well after that i mean it, maybe polo g is a sure thing i hope so right yeah so i mean it <laughs> As we talked about last year with the Grammys, Best New Artist is very confounding definition and eligibility requirements as an award. Part of that, you can be submitted three times, meaning three different years. Seems kind of antithetical to the definition of new. Also, I, I still can't really wrap my head around it because as we know, Polo G, as well as even NBA Youngboy, are somehow eligible for Best New Artist even though their debut albums came out in 2019 young boy in particular has been around for years and years you know dominating youtube for years i don't know how you can say that his impact happened in the last grammy cycle obviously it happened before that so i i just don't understand best new artist to this day but on the other hand that means there's a lot of people in the mix that are quote-unquote worthy of such an honor whether they're new or not you know i mean shit blackpink is somehow eligible for best new artist still they debuted in 2016 to a lot of fanfare and success dude glass animals is eligible glass Pretty animals nice. they they have three records that have been like beloved in indie rock and alternative spheres i i can't believe that they're eligible because um, they have that one pop hit now like it doesn't make any sense <laughs> Blackpink's album, sense. the album, came out last fall, somehow keeping them new. I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, like, imagine Coachella a, a, was 2019 when they I was had their say, amazing a new, set. A new artist basically like blowing up at Coachella with like the most people at their stage. Like that's just, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, so it, it is a bit like whatever. They, they just want to get some big memes out there. After Olivia Rodrigo, after Polo G, which I think we both would agree, he will probably be up there. The Kid Leroy also seems likely mm-hmm. to get a nomination, yeah. you know, doing big numbers. Uh, the Bieber tie seems certain. Who else He'll is stay. up there for you? Yeah, so those all make sense. I would say Blackpink need to be nominated if they're yeah, eligible. Yeah. That That's just egregious. 
you know, mm-hmm. if they weren't. I mean, there's there's some other K-pop acts too, like Twice and Monster X, which are actually older than Blackpink. Mm-hmm. That's still eligible. I don't understand, but I feel like Blackpink's the one that they would go with there. Uh, Rina Sawayama, which I thought was a great pick last year, still apparently eligible. I love those out al- that album. I love that EP. Need to pick that. Yep, uh, those make sense to me. You know, Phineas is eligible as a performer, even though he's won multiple Grammys in support of Billy because he didn't win them as a performer. He can be nominated for Best New Artist. On the other hand, that album, debut album that just came out was outside his Grammy period. So it's really more about the singles and the first EP. You have to imagine the Grammy Recording Academy is so in the bag for the Billy Eilish, Phineas O'Connell family operation that Phineas is probably getting in there. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think he probably will just especially because he has actually won uh, alongside Billy before. I mean, I'm sure he probably has the trophy somewhere in his office or recording studio, but uh, I don't know that it's just so disappointing, especially when there's so many good people. Um, right. You know, so Weedy is eligible. Um, we mentioned another one that's questionable to me in terms of newness. It doesn't make Icy girl sense. was years ago <laughs> yeah but sweetie seems someone that that should be nominated mm-hmm. like i mentioned glass animals i'd like to see arlo parks get some love yeah. um you i know, think that one's pretty likely i hope so uh because we didn't like love uh her new album but i i, I think we feel like there's so much potential there that you have to kind of highlight right. it um yeah, the, I mean, there can probably be what ten people nominated for this. It feels yeah, like every... it, it's a pretty deep list traditionally. Um, and there are some people that aren't eligible. Uh, if you win a, if you won a Grammy already, you can't win Best New Artist. So uh, Jack Harlow, notably, or he nominated, not even win. Jack Harlow, Kali Uchis, they cannot be up in here. Morgan Whalen is ineligible for different reasons. It has nothing to do with his controversy, apparently, but more about the determined impact of his previous songs again very hard to understand but seems like he's not there on the other hand Ava Max is somehow eligible with Sweet But Psycho what the fuck dude like, uh, sure okay <laughs> that song yes. went top 10 in 2019 after being around for ages we know how long she's been around and how but again like June 2019 is when the song hit the top 10 how the fuck is that make you new still? I don't get it. Um, 24K Golden, Flo Millie. I don't like them too much, but Don Tolliver. There's a lot of hip hop here. Japanese mm-hmm. Breakfast, Baby Keem. Um, I think you can make a really good list. Um, it's just a matter about who they end up picking. Yeah. Uh, Bo Burnham oh. also surprisingly is eligible for this. Is I eligible. Think, oh. Yeah, because of the impact of the music associated with inside is kind of the implication obviously bo burnham not new in the literal sense newer in the music sense i guess but that that would also kind of feel weird to me but i mean yeah you you can you they there should be no reason why this is not a very stacked uh list with really good artists slash really popular artists right yeah and popular side olivia kid Leroy, polo they all feel pretty safe, but Blackpink should be there. On the other hand, I would love to see Rena, as we said, Japanese Breakfast, mm-hmm. Julian Baker, some of them. You, you can make a really great Best New Artist category, I think. Yeah, and of course, you're going to get some of the ones that we have not reviewed their music. People like Gabby Barrett and Mainskin seem fairly likely to be nominated as well. So there's a lot of people here, um, you know, outside of Rodrigo, Leroy, Polo G., uh, black pink glass animals i would love to see julian baker get that nomination i'd love to see japanese bra- breakfast like you mentioned and rena would just be like if we get rena on there dude yeah the, 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 that that's when you know that they're actually like tuning into the music and not just like oh this person has a name people recognize so um would love that but why don't we move on to uh album of the year um and we'll work our way down to the songs i think so album of the year again <laughs> We kind of already mentioned this. Billie Eilish and Olivia Rodrigo are probably going to get a lot of nominations. Um, so you have to expect Happier Than Ever and Sour to be nominated. But after that, what else are you thinking is a lock for album of the year? 
Yeah, so Billy won two years ago. Last year, album of the year was won by Taylor Swift with Folklore. Seems logical that Evermore, which is from this current uh, eligibility period, you have to imagine Evermore is probably there. I would not pick it to win, but I feel like Evermore is a very safe bet to be nominated. Also, I'd like to think Casey Musgraves' Starcrossed will be nominated, coming out right at the end of the eligibility period. But of course, Casey won album of the year for Golden Hour three years ago. So, you know, you have three Grammy darlings, Billy, Taylor, and Casey all going up for this big award. You you have to reason. Um, and after that, I think is where it gets more interest, right? And I think where the, the populism of the voting perhaps can start to show show itself, right? Because you got a lot of other big artists really famous mainstream A-listers that drop stuff, whether it was this year or the, you know, the very end of 2020. And trying to pick exactly how that shakes out, I think it's probably a little difficult, but there's a ton of huge names here. Um, and this is probably where we'll see just how far the BTS run can go. Can BTS get B nominated for album of the year? That'd be, that'd be great if that happened, to be honest. Obviously, we're going to talk about Butter in a minute. Like They're going to be nominated in the song categories, but they also can get an album up there. That'd be huge. Heck, even if it's just like pop vocal album and not album of the year, that'd be big. But then yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of stuff running for album of the year. Yeah, Butter, like you mentioned, seems like a lock for song and or record of the year. Again, how do you define those? Is, uh always a mystery, <laughs> kind of. Um, but that would be enormous to get B up there and I would be super pumped. Um, man, you know, it, it almost would feel too good to be true if they did, but it would definitely be deserving. Um, especially looking at like, I don't feel like this is a necessarily like particularly strong album list, uh, list of the albums of the year. Like, like Lil Nas X, I think you might've mentioned Montero is mm-hmm. likely to probably be nominated. Yeah. But, but then you also have like Casey Musgrave Starcrossed. And while Starcrossed, uh, I think, is a solid album, doesn't live up to Casey Musgrave's highest standards and uh, right. probably would just be kind of, uh, you know, living off her name. Uh, other albums that are likely or are rumored or favored to be nominated, things like Back of My Mind from her. Um, that album, we did not like at all and is very samey and would just be them writing her as an artist that the Grammys love for whatever reason. Um, Justin Bieber's Justice, while I think having some return to form moments for Bieber, not his strongest stuff and would feel again, like you're just kind of putting Justin Bieber in the category. Um, you know, so then you look about at Drake with certified lover boy. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, great, great point. I mean, out of all of those, probably the worst and, and least inspired of, of his albums for sure. And so then you're like, would would they put Call Me Fiat Lost by Tyler in there? Seems like a long shot, but it it's probably the best album, period. At least best rap album of the yeah. year, in my opinion. Oh, uh, yeah. It should be in there, but I just don't I know if they're going to have the balls to do it. Something like uh, Good News from Gibeon feels like um, a very Grammy Megan. pick. Oh, sorry. Um, When yeah. It's All Said and Done, by, uh, Take Time by Gibeon. Uh, yes. I was looking at this list wrong um feels likely to be in contention anyway yeah but like is that an album you've heard a lot about i've heard maybe a couple of tracks really pop off but not huge love for the album so i don't know good news does deserve to be in there for megan i would say though yeah that'd be interesting you know um megan had a big year last year with savage remix winning twice so you know but like to what you're saying like little nas x I, I, I'd wager that Montero is not the best Lil Nas, a, Lil Nas X album when it's all said and done. You know, it's more of a work mm-hmm. in progress than anything else. And that nominating Montero is really a recognition of his popularity and his stardom and, and potential than anything else, I'd say. Um, I feel like Doja Cat's Planet Her is a pretty safe bet for this. Mm, I think it's definitely yeah. a safe bet for pop vocal, but Doja Cat's a huge a-list artist and has been for quite some time now and i I would bank on this one but yeah i mean there's probably some people we're not thinking of too much could halsey sneak in here it wasn't her most popular album but one of her if not her most celebrated Mm -hmm. ariana grande positions 
the least liked of the last three Ari albums, but she's so popular and so big. Kanye West Donda. In a sense, it'd be kind of interesting if they picked Donda maybe instead of Certified Lover Boy. I, I don't know if I see it, though. Yeah, I don't see that. Yeah, and that was kind of a thought I just had. I was like, yeah, you know, like, the album of the year, it's not not my favorite year to, to, to pick one, honestly, like, in terms of stuff that can actually be nominated, you know? It's mm-hmm. like, you, you look at our top 10 albums list that we've done and we're about to do again, you know, a lot of that stuff doesn't 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 get nominated so it is what it is you know and this year it's like yeah like evermore i mean it's not as good as folklore right right Let's move on from there uh i said everything about nas x bieber justice like you said it's it's better than changes but that's not mm-hmm. the that we shouldn't hang our hat on that because changes was bad you know yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah this this is kind of a tough one for me honestly i don't really know what's gonna happen i would kind of expect maybe bad bunny to get a nomination there for El Ultimo Tour del Mundo. Yeah. Um, they bricked this last year. You, you like to see if this happens, right? Burn a Boy, yeah. Bad Bunny weren't able to rise up beyond the genre categories they're kind of placed in. Mm-hmm. Will the new voting help a Bad Bunny, help a Wiz Kid? You know? Yeah. I'd like to see it, just like I like to see BTS finally break through too. But I also kind of need to see it first before I start predicting it. I would also be really surprised, but pleasantly surprised if Bo Burnham were to sneak in with a nomination for this. Uh, Inside, I feel like could either have a really big night or they just they just totally ignore. And it feels like it's not going to be somewhere in the middle for me. Yeah, I believe it's being submitted in like the visual media category thing. So I don't know if that means it can be mm. an album of the year. I don't actually know. Again, it's the Grammys. It's kind of hard to figure this stuff out. Often, There's a lot of times, the decisions aren't publicized right away. So, yeah, it feels like Will Burnham's going to have a presence, though, at mm-hmm. this. He's somehow eligible for Best New Artist, as we said. So, it's very weird. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just thinking of, like, you know, the, the, anyone else in pop, I, I, I don't know, you know? Because, like, again, Adele, Silk Sonic, they're not going to be nominated here because they're not eligible. Um, It'd be very Grammys to nominate the Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga album, yeah. you know, and just be like, oh, no one listened to this, but Love for Sale is one of the best <laughs> albums of the year. It's like, okay, sure. Old Place not eligible. Ed Sheeran's not eligible. On the other hand, though, you know, Miley Cyrus from last year is eligible. Hmm. Sam Smith kind of forgot about that album. That's eligible. He's been celebrated in the past, you know? Sam Smith like would be tough for me. I'm kind of grasping at straws, though. They're not going <laughs> to nominate the Avalanches. We love that album. That's that's not happening. Yeah, um, Little, Little Sims is not being nominated. Yeah, so. Sh- Sh- Sean Mendes, you know, I think he's pop vocal only, his his chances, you know? So uh, it's, yeah, uh, yeah the, the big awards, it might just be super popularist and be, you know, decent. And, and then again, that's also going to be reflective of the year we've had, and that's okay, you know? Mm-hmm. Man, you just got to understand that context. Um, you know, so it looks like there's a like a handful that seem like locks and then a couple on our wish list. Probably uh, call me if you get lost. Good news. Um, right. You know, B- so BTSB. Like yes. Um, so we'll, we'll see if, if any of those pan out. Uh, why don't we look look at the best song and or record of the year? And again, uh, do you have a good way of, of delineating which, what falls into which category for this? So I already forget which is which, but one of them is supposed to be more about like the music construction, like the sheet music, as it were, of the song. I think that's record. It has to be. Yeah, I think that's record. Like the recording. Yeah. You know? And song right. is like the whole package, including vocals. Hard to delineate, and it feels like, from what I've gathered... Most artists are just submitting one song in both categories besides trying to pick one for each, mm-hmm. which makes it even harder to determine the difference. Yep. So we're just kind of, I think we should just talk about it as one big thing. Well, and it, you know, it, it's interesting because like Livia Rodrigo, when you think about her this year, driver's license dominated the first half of the year, but I really feel like good for you has been the song that has stuck since the album dropped. 
uh, and driver's license is the one that, that she's pushing. Kind of the same for little, little Nas X pushing Montero, it seems, when I, I would say Industry Baby is probably the song from that album that sounds oh, out most. Definitely. So yeah. it's like the, the choices are very interesting, but I expect both of those, Montero and driver's license, to be yeah. noms as well as happier than ever, seems like a lock. What else is up there for you? Right, yeah, I mean, that, that all makes sense. Happier Butter. than ever seems to be the Billy lock. Um, I, I pick their 4 a.m. personally, but yeah, mm-hmm. seems like it's there. Leave the door open, Silk Sonic. Lead single yeah. is eligible, of course, even though the album isn't. Um, that's a lock for sure. And probably one of the best picks to win, honestly. Uh, probably doesn't win. I don't know. You know. I'm not actually sure who wins, you know, unless Olivia just has the Billie Eilish night where she just kind of sweeps the big awards with best new artists and just mm-hmm. a coronation of uh, a new pop force. In hindsight, that might be easy to easy to understand. But if that doesn't happen, then I'm not really sure what directions we go in. You know, like it seems like a Taylor Swift Evermore song is going to get nominated here. I believe she submitted Willow, but like, I, I can't Ooh, imagine a ton no. of enthusiasm for that the way there was for yeah. other stuff with Taylor. You never know, though. Yeah, please no. Um, you know, so you mentioned before Doja Cat. I think Kiss Me More with SZA yes. seems like a lock for this. BTS that's, Butter, that's just you for sure. Yeah, it seems like a lock. Um, yeah, you know, I was just even looking here. I don't even know. Like, <laughs> Bieber could be in the mix twice here with Peaches from him and then uh, the kid Leroy Stay featuring Bieber. Hmm. Both big That's songs. True. You know, I, I bet one of them gets there at the very least, to be honest. Um, It'd be interesting to see if Dua Lipa with the baby gets nominated for Levitating because so, it's so eligible. It's, it, so it seems like she did not submit Levitating Remix for anything. Oh, good. Right. Obviously, good a Levitating Original, not eligible because that album was last Grammys. But because of the remix and the impact of the remix, she technically could have submitted this year. She decided not to. Totally cool with me. She had a great mm-hmm. uh, Grammys last time. So that's cool. Um, you know, we'll get to BTS in a second, but... Other than that, like I don't know like what's else is really supposed to be in the mix. Like we're picking a Billy song, we're picking a Taylor song, driver's license, call me by your name, Montero, leave the door open, one or two Bieber songs, and then what? Bad habits by Ed Sheeran or <laughs> positions by Ari, like they're just kind of pop songs, pop big pop singles, and that's it. You know, it's not like so I'm sure it'll be I'm sure there'll be artists that we're not thinking about not as popular, right? Maybe a Chris Stapleton song or something or her, not, Please no, but maybe another her song, you know, oh. in this category. You know, a, a her song will get in there. It looks like Damage is the one that she might be pushing right now. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, SZA, uh, Good Days, which is a song that I actually don't know if I know or right. can recall. Uh, seems like it's it's up there. Um, man, you know, we haven't even mentioned Lana Del Rey. Dropped two albums. Do you think maybe she'll... Uh, should I get any bugs? So, yeah, so Chemtrails is eligible this year. Blue Bannisters is not. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the last time around for Lana, Norman fucking Rockwell was nominated for Album of the Year, and rightfully so. I don't have quite the same enthusiasm for Chemtrails, but maybe the Recording Academy does. Be smart not to count her out. She's definitely a greater contender, I guess. Is WAP eligible? I'm looking, uh, I'm looking no. through a list WAP here. came out uh, summer August 2020. 2020, so I guess it's yeah. not eligible at this point. Randy Carlisle seems like she, her name is popping up on odds, odds websites. Yeah, I don't know. It, it feels like it's going to be a real mishmash uh, you know, for like those last couple. But, right. man, it's... I don't know. It's uninspiring for some reason this year. I'm... Right. <laughs> and And that's why all my eggs are behind BTS with Butter. Mm-hmm. By all accounts, they only submitted Butter, but they did have three number ones this year with Butter, Permission to Dance, and the Coldplay feature, My Universe. Uh, Coldplay didn't submit My Universe. They submitted uh, Color, Colorama, Colorura, whatever that song's called, instead. But yeah, BTS Butter, you know? Number one for 10 weeks. A great song. It's basically Dynamite 2. They nominated Dynamite last year in a pop group performance. I expect Butter to be in that category too, but I think Butter 
should definitely be in record slash song of the year. And, yeah. you know, af- after driver's license, maybe gets the second most votes. You know, I would not be surprised if it's right up there and perhaps almost wins the award, if not does, because it's totally justified. Yeah, I, I mean, I would love to see them get that win. I, I bet positions will make it into either record or song of the year just because Ari's a name and I think the song has gotten a lot of uh, legs after the album. I could also see the Foo Fighters maybe getting hmm. a nomination, you know, uh, maybe for like making a fire or something like that. Um, actually, speaking of that, not going to be nominated, but the uh, Mark Ronson remix of that is so much better than the original. Uh, mm. So ch- check that out if you like that. St. Vincent, I think, will probably get some rock nominations or maybe alternative is what yeah. she's mm-hmm. putting herself into. But she'll be up there for rock. You know, it feels like there's a chance that it's going to be like a couple of like elder statesmen, Paul McCartney or Springsteen are both eligible. One of them or maybe even both will probably get nominated for best rock album and then it might be some new people war on drugs is probably also likely to get nominated. Uh, they're, not, they're not eligible that just came out oh it's not eligible okay so then then you're probably looking at like you mentioned miley before yep hmm. john Mayer is in the mix Ugh, please Sob Sob Rock. Rock. no <laughs> no <laughs> How about coldplay? A, uh coldplay is not in the mix either oh, too soon okay yeah uh, greta van vliet second album is greta van vliet's debut ep won grammys yeah grammy darling right there wouldn't surprise me you mentioned the food fighters dave what about mgk that's the thing you know machine gun kelly had a very successful pivot to pop punk at least commercially you know and maybe look into his perception at some metal festivals recently it's not all good for mgk in the rock community but given his popularity given the, the acceptance of this pivot in the industry certainly more accepted than his hip-hop had been mm-hmm. i wouldn't be shocked i really wouldn't be even if i think it's kind of a callous uh clearly brand managed pivot the album was big and it was with this kind of populist voting i wouldn't be shocked to see it rise up i don't know then again, you might have more traditionalist people in the Recording Academy that have totally rejected that album. You know, we, 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 I really, we really got to see it happen. Um, you mentioned Halsey before. I think she's in the alternative category, though, not the traditional rock category. She's not really up against those guys. Um, but there's actually Miley a fair nominated. amount of... Yeah, there's a fairly, high, a fairly high amount of high-profile rock acts in the mix this year. That's not often the mm-hmm. case. Yeah, I, I think... As long as Miley gets nominated, I would feel pretty happy with that. Um, you know, I'm trying. I don't even know who else I would really like be jazzed about. In this. Kings of Leon? No, <laughs> no. I mean, the album wasn't as bad as maybe we said it was at the time, but it's just kind of right. Meh. Um, yeah, Saint Vincent would be cool, I guess. Yeah, I mean, and she gets a lot of love from the Academy or the Academy, yeah, from the Grammys. Um, but Dave, give me a quick rundown of who you think will get uh, nominated for best rap album. Best rap album is loaded with famous people, right? Last year, best rap album was loaded with old heads. Freddie okay. Gibbs, D Smoke, Nas. Somehow not run the jewels, though. <laughs> now, we have a lot of really famous rappers, rappers that have been nominated before. Drake, Kanye. J. Cole, Tower the Creator, 21 Savage. That's my top five right now. Sort of my lover boy, Donda, Call Me If You Get Lost, The Off Season, and Savage Mode 2. Savage Mode 2, eligible from last year. Mr. Right Now, contender for best rap song. Song oh, yeah. I think that's a really great rap category. The expectation should be that Tyler wins. Then again, if Drake gets nominated for album of the year maybe he also would win the lesser category one stands to reason that didn't happen last year though do a beat taylor swift at pop vocal album and then taylor won album of the year so it is possible i'd be rooting for tyler hard in this because he actually made a real rap album this time remember he criticized the grammys when he won for igor he said this isn't really rap but you still put me in rap anyway because that's what you do with black people Mm -hmm. i'd love to see tyler win here but I think that's a really stacked category. And 
there's yeah. you know there's no there's no one really in the mix to crash it unexpectedly or undeservingly right so i i feel i'm feeling good about it if, i think for me it's call me if you get lost and then everything else really that it just yeah. feels so so far apart from the others but yeah i, I think it is strong this year and you know you, you we talked about like kanye and drake and how their names are being thrown out there i i hope they don't get the nominations that uh other could go to some other more deserving people uh but i'd you know, be curious is, to see if playboy curious. cardi's whole lot of red makes any oh. noise oh That'd a lot be of er- early predicting sites seem to give a decent chance. I I'd imagine they put it in the rap categories because you don't know what else to do with that album. Yeah, which I would totally I, I don't blame them honestly. Yeah, so th- that that's something to keep an eye out for, right? Like uh, Young Thugs Punk, not eligible, came out too recently. Um, I guess the the other thing we should shouldn't forget um, would be Jack Harlow's debut album from last December. And Megan The Stallion's album, Good News. So, Megan and Jack, both Grammy nominated last year. Megan won. Probably the smart money would be at least one of them getting into this category, which means someone gets pushed out. Mm. Um, as long as Tyler's not the one being pushed out, I don't mind. But I'd really like to see 21 get in here, even though I don't know if it's super yeah. likely. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Um, any last thoughts on what uh what you want to see your hope happens or predictions yeah man um avalanches for edm uh electronic certainly, certainly. Yeah. uh curious if cuddies you know hmm. cup come back it was widely accepted man the moon three you know not that cuddy had gone away but cuddy got a lot of uh admiration and got some flowers when he came back you know to hip-hop in an earnest way like that right so Man the Moon 3, maybe also kind of in the mix there. Not sure. But yeah, I'm really looking at how much does BTS get nominated in terms of does B break through? Uh, what happens with Best New Artist? We went through a litany of eligible and worthy people. So I, I don't expect to be mad at the category. And um, yeah, we kind of reiterated that album of the year and even song and record of the year kind of a crapshoot when it comes to popular categories more yep. reflective of the year we've had than anything else so yeah i guess rap rap uh i want to see them give the rap award out on the broadcast for once and not just give it away at 4 p.m before the broadcast starts mm-hmm. you know that that would show an acknowledgement of the reality of the music industry and what's popular and what's listened to and what's liked so that'd be nice if they actually treated hip hop like a real category. Yeah. So that's something I'm rooting for. Let Let's hope it happens. Uh, just real quick, also hoping that Disclosure gets nominated in Best uh, Electronic Album. Energy. Oh, yeah. uh, anyways, let's wrap up there. Drop your Grammy predictions if you're watching on YouTube. But uh, Dave, what should everybody be tuning into for next week? Yeah, so an album that's not eligible for the Grammys, of course, will be the new Adele album after nearly five years. So obviously a lot riding on that. Very exciting time. Uh, Then we have a lot of movies. HBO, Warner Brothers, Will Smith, King Richard out. Theaters and HBO. Netflix, Lin-Manuel Miranda's directorial debut starring Andrew Garfield. Tick, tick, boom is out. Ghostbusters Afterlife. From Jason Reitman, the son of the director of Ghostbusters, Ivan Reitman. Supposed to be a return to Ghostbusters form and Stranger Things retro-esque. We'll see about that. Uh, Also excited to talk about the end of Foundation Season 1 on Apple TV+. Plus. Big sci-fi themes, baby. And speaking of Foundation and IP Game of Thrones replacements, Amazon's Wheel of Time is starting up on prime so a lot of, lot lot of big watch. stuff uh, on the way as we head into thanksgiving lots to watch yeah heading to thanksgiving wow yeah the year's going by fast yeah it's weird that it's gonna For be really. 2022 so soon anyways um soundcloud.com slash nostalgia pod and youtube.com slash nostalgia pod and uh drop us some some thoughts on twitter at nostalgia pod as well we'll see you next week stay red